I want you to turn with me to the scripture that Sean so ably read, found in Genesis chapter 3, the title of the sermon, Fig Leaves. Fig Leaves. We're going to look at the word this morning and see what the Lord has to tell us. So I'm going to read again the scripture in your hearing. It's always good to read the scripture more than once because usually we can extract some additional jewels from the scripture. At Genesis 3, beginning in verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Now most of you already know, those students of the spirit of prophecy, you know that Adam and Eve were covered in a, they were enshrouded in light. You know that from your study of the spirit of prophecy. And you could actually glean that from your study in the Bible if you look carefully. But they were wrapped up in light. I want to read a statement for you from Christ's Object Lessons, page 310. Christ's Object Lessons, page 310. Listen carefully. The white robe of innocence was worn by our first parents when they were placed by God in holy Eden. They lived in perfect conformity to the will of God. All the strength of their affections was given to the Heavenly Father. All of them. A beautiful soft light, the light of God, enshrouded the Holy Pier. This robe of light was a symbol of their spiritual garments of heavenly innocence. Had they remained true to God, it would ever have continued to enshroud them. But when sin entered, when sin entered now, church, they severed their connection with God and the light that had encircled them departed. Naked and ashamed, they tried to supply the place of the heavenly garments by sewing together fig leaves for a covering. Turn with me to 1 John 1.5. 1 John 1.5. I have all my scriptures written here, so I don't have to look them up. So I will wait on you. 1 John 1.5. You get there, say, Amen. amen. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So the light that Adam and Eve were covered with, she says that it was the light of God. And as long as they remain connected to God, they would be covered in this light. The light was evidence of their purity. But when they disobeyed, the connection with God was severed. They were no longer pure inside, so the light that covered them, it disappeared, and they were naked. So I want you to notice the sequence of events here. They disobeyed. 
The connection with God is severed. The light disappears and they're naked. Now this was the condition of God's people at the beginning of sin. Naked. Now let's take a look at what the Bible says will be the condition of God's people near the end of time. Let's take a look. Turn with me to Revelation 3. You're familiar with these verses. You've heard them over and over again, but we're going to put these verses in the right context. Genesis and Revelation. Now we'll turn to Revelation. I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 3. You should be able to find that pretty quickly. And we're going to look at verse 14 first, and then we will look at 17. Again, you'll familiar with these verses. I'll go ahead and read them. And under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Let's skip down to verse 17. Because thou saith, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not, knowest not, that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and what? Naked. Now, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, church, now. They were naked in Genesis. And we have already established in Genesis how Adam and Eve became naked. Disobedience. The connection with God is severed. I hope the thinking caps are going on here. Disobedience. The connection with God is severed. The light disappeared. And they were naked. So how does God's last day church become naked? Disobedience. Disobedience. And what happens? The connection with God is severed. We're talking about the last day church now. The connection with God is severed. The light church, the light disappears. And the church is naked. Do we know what this means? How do we know that the connection of the last day church has been severed with God? How do we know that? Turn with me, you're still in Revelation. Turn with me to Revelation 3. You're already there, verse 20. How do we know that this connection has been severed? God's last day church now. You're there. You've seen this verse. Let's read it. Behold, I stand at the door and what? No, no. Knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. Now, I know you've read that verse a hundred times, perhaps more. But I have a question for you. Where does this verse physically place Christ? Where is he at? Outside the door. Outside what? Okay. Yes, he's outside your heart. But, you know, the Bible is full of symbolism. So let me ask you a question. If I told you that someone came to my door and knocked on my door, where would they be? Outside where? There you go. Outside the house. Revelation 3.20 says Christ is outside the house. Where the question is, what is a house in the Bible? I want you to turn with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter 2.5. What does the house symbolize in the Bible? See, God expects us to use some common sense. Jesus is knocking on a door, and he knows that we know what a door is. And he knows that if somebody's knocking on the door, they're talking about a house. So what is a house symbolized in the Bible? 1 Peter 2, 5, I'll read in your hearing. Ye also, as lively stones, are built upon a what church? A spiritual house. A holy priesthood. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So what is a house in the Bible? A church. A church. church. You. You are a house. The church is a house in the Bible. So, the church is a house, and where is Christ re where is Christ physically located in the verse in relation to this house? Where is he at church? Christ. He's outside the house. So if Christ is outside the house, and the house is the church, Christ is outside the church. The church. That's what Revelation 3.20 is saying. 
Can you imagine that? The Bible is telling us that in the last days, Christ will be outside of his last day church. Does that make sense to you? Can you imagine how God must feel? Describing a last day church, we've established that the only reason why the church can be naked is a disobedience, the connection was severed, is severed, then the light disappears. What is that saying about God's last day church in Revelation with regards to the light? If the connection is severed, it means there's what church? No what? No light. That's a scary thought. Are we saying that God's last day church has no light? Now, I'm not saying that. The Bible is telling you that. The Bible is telling us the condition of last day church, of God's last day church. And it appears in Revelation 3.20 that Christ is outside the church. I want you to know today that there's a solution to the church's problem. And God makes it very clear in scripture. But first we must identify the problem. If I were to ask you, do you agree with the fact that Christ is outside the church? You couldn't help but agree. You see the evidence of it. From the music, to the dress, to the sexual orientation, to the fornication, to the diet. You've seen it. You've seen the evidence that Christ is outside the church. And so you might ask me, are you telling me Brother Preacher, that despite all the advantages that Christ has given his church in these last days, all the wisdom of his word from Genesis to Revelation, the power of his Holy Spirit being available, the gift of prophecy, are you telling me that despite all these advantages, after 6,000 years, are you telling me that the church is naked again? What we find, church, in Revelation is that God's last day church is in no better spiritual condition than where Adam and Eve after they sinned. Naked. Naked. But how did this happen? How did Christ end up outside of the church? It all began in Genesis. So we have to go back to Genesis to find our answer. Please go back with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. We're talking about fig leaves today. Now we haven't mentioned them yet, but we're going to get there. Just stick with me. We're laying a foundation. Genesis chapter 3. We're going to look at verse 7. We read that earlier. The Bible says, in the eyes of them both were opened, and they, what church? They knew. Remember that, we're going to come back to that word. They knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made them say of cells aprons. Christ's object lesson tells us, naked and ashamed, they tried to supply the place of the heavenly garments by sewing together fig leaves for a covering. Now, I want you to listen to this. She describes what the fig leaves are. Now, maybe you might have read this sometime if you've read Christ's object lesson, but I would venture to say that most of us have skimmed over this and did not catch this. Everything in the Bible has meaning. And God puts it there for a reason. Let me uh, share this with you. This is actually found in letters of manuscripts. Here's what the spirit of prophecy says about these fig leaves. This is the covering of all who have transgressed the law of God. This is the covering that all who have transgressed the law of God have used since the days of Adam and Eve's disobedience. They have sewn together fig leaves to cover their nakedness caused by transgression and sin. Listen to what she says the fig leaves represent. The fig leaves represent arguments used to cover disobedience. Arguments used to cover disobedience. This is what the fig leaves represent. 
Listen, listen to this. When the Lord calls the attention of men and women to the truth, she says, the making of fig leaves into aprons will commence in order to hide the nakedness of the soul of every transgressor. Arguments to cover disobedience. Fig leaves. I have to work on the Sabbath to pay my bills. God understands. Fig leaves. Fig leaves. I know that we shouldn't sleep together, but we're in a relationship. He's the only one I'm sleeping with, and it's not like I'm sleeping around. God is okay with that. Fig leaves. I know the music in church is loud, but it's part of our culture. So God should be okay with that. Fig leaves, church. Arguments used to cover disobedience. I know that marriage is between a man and a woman, but I have these, these feelings. God is love. Surely he, he understands. Fig leaves. Fig leaves. Arguments used to cover up disobedience. I only commit this sin every once in a while. It's not like I do it every day. God won't condemn me if I just do it every once in a while. It's, it's not like it's a, it's a terrible habit. It's just occasionally. Fig leaves. Fig leaves. So we use church a variety of ways to cover our nakedness, to make ourselves feel better. We refuse to acknowledge the existence or seriousness of our sins. Fig leaves. We, we place the blame on others or circumstances that cause our sins. Fig leaves. We try to counterbalance our sins with acts of charity or goodness in the hopes that our good will outweigh the bad. Fig leaves. We compare ourselves to others, thinking that our sins are less severe in comparison. Fig leaves. Fig leaves. But church, the most devastating effect of all this self-deception, all of these fig leaves, the most devastating effect is what happens inside of us. The heart remains desperately wicked. We remain cold and dark and disconnected from God. And Christ remains outside, knocking, asking to come in. So we, we hurt each other. We're cold to our spouses, cold to others, cold and unsympathetic to our children. When the pressure and stress comes, things come out of our mouths that should not come. Immoral thoughts permeate our thinking. We find ourselves doing things in secrecy that we would dare not tell anyone. And it's all wrapped up, church, in this web of self-deception called fig leaves. Fig leaves. I'm reading from Letters and Manuscripts, 1897. I would call on all who would win heaven to take warning. Do not devote your precious probationary time to sewing together fig leaves to cover the nakedness that is the result of sin. I want you, church, to notice Adam and Eve's behavior after sin. Because that scene, that scenario, provides the answer for God's last day church. You will eventually see it for yourself as we look at it. Turn back with me to Genesis chapter 3. 
We're going to read it yet another time. We keep reading until the picture becomes clear. I want you to notice something in this scene. Genesis chapter 3. I'll start at verse 7 again. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. So church, why did they sew fig leaves together? Why did they do that? Because why? I didn't hear it. What were they trying to do? They cover their nakedness, right? That's why they sewed the fig leaves together, to cover their nakedness, right? That's what the Bible says. Now, verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife, what they do? They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And here's what he said in verse 10. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was what? Amen. Now, wait a minute. It says, he says, I was naked and I hid myself. But you just read in verse 7 that he was not naked. That in fact, they used fig leaves to cover themselves. So what, what, is, this, what is this telling us here? They weren't naked. They, they had used fig leaves. What is actually going on here? Here's what is going on here. When they heard the voice of God, as God came near and closer to them, it was only then that they realized that the fig leaves that they had sewn together were inadequate to cover their nakedness. You see, church, it is only when we respond to the voice of God, it is only when we come near to Him that we will realize that our fig leaves, our excuses for sins, are not enough to cover our nakedness. As long as we are not near Him, as long as we are not connected to Him, we will not be able to see our nakedness. Now, I want you to understand what that means. Because the Bible says in Genesis 3, 7, and I told you I was going to point this out to you. The Bible says that the eyes of them were both open and they knew that they were naked. But do you know how the Bible describes God's last day church? In Revelation 3, 7. Does God's last day church know that it's naked? No. Who do you think was actually in a better position? Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve or God's last day church? Adam and, Eve. Adam and Eve. They knew they were naked. Do you see the difficult predicament that God's church is in? It is one thing to be naked. It's another thing not to know you're naked. But I want to go back to this point here. Adam and Eve had used fig leaves to cover themselves. And in their minds, it was adequate until God showed up and drew closer to them. And then they realized that the fig leaves they had sown were not adequate to cover their nakedness. That was God's formula for man to recognize their nakedness was nearness, was closeness to him. What a terrible state to be in, to be naked and not know it. A few years ago, a friend of mine showed me how to put drywall on my basement. I knew nothing about it. And so he told me that when I finished the drywall, he said, you're going to look at that wall and it's going to look to you like it's going to be smooth. He said, but it won't be smooth. You're gonna, there's going to be all kinds of defects in that wall. It'll be defective and uneven. I said, okay, I appreciate that. So once he showed me, I got going on that wall. I put the mud on there. I put the sand on there, and I sanded it. And I said to myself, I don't care what he said. My wall is going to be smooth. It's not going to be uneven, not going to be defective. 
I put layers, church, and layers upon sand on there. I sat at it over and over again. And when I finished, I stood by and I looked at that wall. Those were all the walls in my basement. I was so proud of myself. My chest was stuck out. I did it. So that next week, I went to see him. And I told him, I said, listen, you told me my walls would be uneven, bumpy. My walls are smooth, just like a baby's skin. And then he laughed at me. He said, here's what I want you to do, Gerald. I want you, when you get home today, go get a flashlight. And I want you to turn off the lights in the basement. And I want you to take that flashlight and I want you to put it against the wall and I want you to look at your wall. I said, no problem. I'll do that, there's no problem. So I went home to church, got my flashlight. And I turned the lights out and I put that flashlight up against the wall. And I was shocked. I had more heels and crevices and gaps in the wall than the Grand Canyon Church. It was terrible. How could this be? I spent so much time on the wall. How could it be that I had all these gaps and, and defects in the wall? But you know, I could not see the defects until I put the light on the wall. I couldn't see. You cannot see your nakedness until the light of Christ shines on your heart. Until then, you'll never see it. Until God's church opens that door and lets the light come in, you'll never see it. God's been knocking for over 6,000 years to come in. And the church will always be naked until it lets the light come in. I'm reading for, from Steps to Christ, page 24. Steps to Christ. Page 24. The light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Listen carefully. Illumines the secret chambers of the soul. Listen to this. And the hidden things of darkness are made manifest. The hidden things. The things in the corner. You know, those, those secret things that maybe you haven't even discovered. It takes the presence of Christ to reveal the things in your heart that shouldn't be there. Steps of Christ, page 64. Listen to this. Oh, listen to this carefully. The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. Did you hear that? Do you appear faulty in your own eyes? If you don't, you're not coming close to Jesus. Listen to what she says. For your vision will be clearer and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct contrast to his perfect nature. You ever felt that? Have you seen that? Have you seen your true condition? Well, there's a silver lining in this church. We're going to get there. But I want you to see, I want you to understand where God is trying to take us as a church. Listen to what she says, though. You're going to see your imperfections in, in broad and distinct contrast. Now, but listen to what she says. She says, this is evidence that Satan's delusions have lost their power. Did you hear that? When you begin to see yourself for what you really are, your true condition, she said, this is evidence that Satan's delusions have lost their power. Amen. And the vivifying influence of the Spirit of God is arousing you. So I want you to think about that. She says, when you begin to see your condition, when you are beginning to see your nakedness, it means that you are no longer under Satan's delusion. That brought another question to my mind. So if we cannot see our delusions, if we cannot see our nakedness, when we're under Satan's delusion, hmm, what does that mean with regards to God's last day church? What does that say? 
if, if I can't see my nakedness, if I am under Satan's delusions, and Revelation says that God's last day church is naked and doesn't know it, what must that mean? That God's last day church is under an illusion by Satan. That's what they're saying. She's saying that last, the last day church can't see his nakedness because it is under Satan's delusions. She makes another point in this quote. She says, once you are able to see your nakedness, she says it means that the Spirit of God is beginning his work inside of you. Now, that's a blessing. See, some folks wouldn't be excited over that. Some folks wouldn't be excited over that. But if you're able to see your nakedness, praise the Lord. Because what that means is God's Spirit is working in you. God's last day church cannot see its nakedness because it's under delusion. Why can't the last day church see its nakedness? Now we've answered this question, but I'm going to make it plain here. Why? Why? Because the light that would enable us to see our nakedness, the light that would allow us to see our nakedness is outside the church. Outside of your heart knocking, asking to come in. Until the light comes in, the church can't see its nakedness. Until the light comes in. Until the light comes inside of you, you cannot see your nakedness. Oh, you ought to demand this light. You ought to demand this light. You ought to desire this light more than anything. It is the worst situation to be in, to be in a condition that you are completely unaware of. Yet that is the description that Revelation gives for the last day of church, but it doesn't have to be yours. It doesn't have to be your description. It doesn't have to be you. We do not have to be under Satan's delusion because the answer God provided in Genesis, just as he drew near to Adam and Eve and they were finally able to see that their fig leaves were not adequate, when Christ draws near to us, we will see that our excuses for sin, our fig leaves are not adequate to cover our sins. And then the Spirit of God will be able to do his work in God's church. But God did something, church, for Adam and Eve because the fig leaves were not enough to cover their nakedness. And I want you to see the symbolism of this. The Bible tells us in Genesis 3.21, go ahead and turn over there, you're already in, in verse 3. The Bible tells us in Genesis 3.21, it is just so amazing how everything that God puts in this Bible, there's meaning in it, but you got to dig for it. You just got to dig for it. Genesis 3.21, and unto Adam also and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. The verse says, he clothed them. Now in the Hebrew, that word clothe means that he put it on them. He put it on them. They did not put it on themselves. Now, maybe about now, you might be beginning to see some of the symbolism, but it's not quite there yet, but it'll get there. They could not put on the skins themselves. God put them on him, on them. Now, I want you to imagine this scene, and this scene involves some holy imagination, but I believe it's consistent with what, what happened. The Bible doesn't say this happened what I'm going to describe to you just like this, but I believe this is the way it happened. I want you to follow me. I want you to imagine this scene. So God comes to Adam and Eve, and he tells Adam, Adam, you stand here, 
And Eve, you stand here. Now, first of all, I need you to take off your fig leaves. You see, fig leaves are of man's devising. They represent excuses for sin. We already established that. God can't take those off. You have to decide to take those off. So God, so Adam and Eve, they, they remove their fig leaves. And then God begins to approach Adam with the coat of skin. And Adam stops. Remember, Adam has named all the animals. And so Adam recognizes something. He said, wait a minute, what a God, is, is that a, yes, yes, Adam, I had to, I had to kill my creation to create a covering for you. Now, you're, you're not going to like this covering because it's nothing, it does not compare to the light, Adam, that covered you. But it's going to be adequate enough to cover your nakedness. So I had to kill my creation, Adam, in order to create this coat of skin. And now Adam and Eve, church, are beginning to realize the seriousness of what they've done. So God tells them, that's not all. That's not all. You see, Adam, because of what you've done, your connection with me is severed. You may have already noticed that the coldness of this thing, that the oneness is not there. The intimacy has disappeared. You may have already noticed that. And I already miss it, Adam. I already miss it. I want to reestablish my connection with you. So what I have to do is I have to send my son on this earth to die for you so that I can reestablish this connection. Wait, wait a minute. God, are you, are you talking about Jesus? Jesus has to come and die for me? Surely, not, not him, Lord. Surely there's another way. No. No, Adam. There's no other way. My son must come to die. It is the only way that we are going to be intimate again. It is the only way we are going to be one again, Adam. But why would you do that, God? Why not just let us die? Why, why let him? Why let him come on this earth to die for me? Why? The Bible tells us, church, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. The Bible says that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. That joy was that oneness with God again. That joy was that intimacy that he once had with man. And church, when I thought about this scene, and the Lord just kind of put these thoughts in my mind about what may have happened in that conversation, something puzzled me. And I asked myself, why is he so desperate to be one with me? And I am not desperate to be one with him. Why? Lord, help us. Adam and Eve could not cover their nakedness. And when God approached Adam and Eve and he clothed them and put those skins on them, it was symbolic. It was symbolic. Because in order for God to put that skin on them symbolically, God was reflecting on something that would happen in the future. I want you to turn with me to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 61. Isaiah 61. The Bible is one in meaning. You've got to read scripture to scripture, comparing scripture with scripture. So much pregnancy with meaning here. 
Isaiah 61 10. I hear pages turning still. Amen. I'll wait for you to get there because I want you to read the scripture. Isaiah 61 10. Here we go. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath what church? Clothed me. That means he has put it on you. He had to do that in Genesis. So you would understand what he had to do in the New Testament. He had to explain to you what had to happen. You cannot put on this robe of righteousness. He must clothe you with it. And Isaiah tells us, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has what church? Covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. He covers us. Amen. He covers us. Listen to this. Christ Object Lessons. Page 311. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. So what we're now describing, we're now describing the intimacy that Adam and Eve had with God in the garden before sin. This is what we're describing right now. Listen, listen carefully. When we submit ourselves to Christ, the heart is united with his heart. I, I can't imagine how that felt for Adam and Eve. That the will is merged with his will. Can you imagine that? This is what she is suggesting we can have now. The mind becomes one with his mind. This is what God wants. The thoughts are brought into captivity to him. Listen to this statement. We live his life. Now that's, if that doesn't blow you away, we live his life. This is what it means to be clothed with the garment of his righteousness. And that's why God had to put that skin and Adam and Eve to show them that he had to cover them. They couldn't cover their sins. They had to stop making excuses. They had to remove those fig leaves. And then God himself had to cover their nakedness, their sinfulness, with his perfect robe of righteousness. And that's what he longs to do for each and every one of us, to cover us with this perfect robe of righteousness, church. But there's one thing you have to be willing to do. Remove those fig leaves. Stop making excuses for sin. Stop covering up our sinfulness with, with arguments. When I was a boy, I at times had problems putting on my shirt. I don't know why, it's just, just one of those things. And so after a while, I would find my mother. And so I would go to her and she would say, give me the shirt, son. I would give her the shirt. And, and my mom would attempt to put the shirt on me. In church, I would twist my arms and twist my body and finally she would say, Gerald, Gerald, stop fighting and stand still. And so I would stop, stop fighting and I would stand still and I would just put out my arms and then she would gently slip that shirt over me. God wants desperately, church, to cover your nakedness with his robe of righteousness. Stop fighting. Stop fighting. Stand still and let him do it. Stop twisting your arms and twisting your bodies and making excuses for sin. Stand still. Stop fighting. Let him gently slip that robe of righteousness around you. Your will will be merged with his will. 
your mind with his mind, your thoughts with his thoughts, you will live his life. It's time to remove the fig leaves, church. It's time to remove the excuses for sin. It's time to let God cover our nakedness with his righteousness. God's answer for the last day church is simple. He's knocking on the door. The light is outside. All we have to do is open the door and the light will come in. And then we will see ourselves for what we are and then we will say, Lord, I'm naked. Can you help me? And he will say, gladly, come here, my child. He will place that robe of righteousness around you ever so gently. And you will live his life. Last quote. No man can cover his soul with the garments of Christ's righteousness while practicing known sins or neglecting known duties. Sin must go. If you desire to have that oneness with Christ, you desire to have your will merged with his will, you must desire to give up all sin. All sinful thoughts, all sinful action, all carnality, you must be willing to give that up and let God fill you with his spirit. Because when you see your nakedness, she says that it is evidence that his spirit is working in your heart. I know that all of us here desire our will to be merged with his will. We desire our thoughts to be merged with his thoughts. We desire to live his life. But we need help. We're going to pray for that help today. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed as we open the doors of the church. Now, when your heads are bowed, it means you're praying. We're praying for each and every individual here today. This message may have been one that somebody needed to hear. Maybe you recognize, church, that as you look at your life, that you have been covering, attempting to cover your nakedness with fig leaves. Maybe you say that you've been using these arguments to cover disobedience, to make, to make excuses for sin. Perhaps you've strayed away a bit and you've become comfortable with your nakedness. You want to come back because you want to be in that city where the light of God lightens it and there's just love and, and beauty. You want to be there. And you know you need to return. First appeal, while the heads are bowed, the church is praying. It's for those, if you believe you've gone astray, if you believe you have ignored your nakedness, I just want to invite you, while the heads are bowed, no one's looking to raise your hands. Just raise your hands. Amen. Amen. God doesn't want me to be naked. But the first step to healing is to recognize that we are naked. That's what God tells us in Revelation. Second appeal. Second appeal for all of us who don't want to admit that we're naked. We don't want to admit it. But the fact is, we know deep down inside we are. 
You want the Holy Spirit? You want the light to shine upon you so that you can see every single defect in your character. You want to see it all, all the dirt. You want to see it all. Because you know that once you see it all, that is the beginning of your conversion. That is the beginning of your change. That is the beginning of God's work in your heart. And when you do that, God then will come and gently clothe you with his robe of righteousness. So all of you, the remaining, if you wish to have that experience with God, I just want to invite you to get on your knees today. We're going to pray. We're going to pray for that. We're going to pray for God to show us our nakedness. And then we're going to pray for God once he does that, to cover us with his robe of righteousness so we can be pure and one with him. I'm going to ask for two prayers today. You don't have to use this mic, but I want Elder Robinson to pray for us. Or Sister Rita, I want Sister Rita to pray for us. Two prayers, Elder Robinson and Sister Rita, as we kneel. Go ahead, Chuck. Our Father and our God, Lord, thank you for 